it wasn't like we set out 39 years ago saying, you know, we're going to be these phenomenal uh, property managers and we're never going to evict anybody. I, I believe it was as a result of us creating systems of screening uh, applicants for our rental properties, having a clear eight step screening process that we've created over the years. When you come to us and say you want to rent, rent one of our properties, it's like going on a blind date and eviction is like a divorce. And if anybody has ever been in any kind of relationship, a divorce is emotional, is costly, is ugly. Hey landlords, welcome to the Better Than Success podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Purvey. And before we get into this super amazing episode, I have an announcement for you. If you haven't already heard, I announced on October 30th, 2023, that we are rescheduling the date for the Women in Real Estate Summit from November 11th to December 9th and the 10th. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because the conclave portion of the Women in Real Estate Summit, which is the two hour portion that was happening at the end of the summit, where you can find a deal, lock up your deal with the title company, get pre-qualified for hard money lending, get pre-qualified for uh, business credit. That portion, which was two hours, I could not sleep at night knowing that it was only going to be two hours. It needs to be its own day. So... This decision did not come lightly. We had to decide to make Wire Summit two days instead of one. And in order to do that, we had to move the date. I could not sleep at night for weeks with this, okay? So I want you guys to know that um, I apologize if this provides any inconvenience for anyone. I truly do. But the most important thing is I want to make sure that you guys get as much value as possible. And I want to make sure that your children's children thanks you based off of the work that you do today, do on December 9th and 10th at the Women in Real Estate Summit. I want to make sure that your children, children are thanking you for all that you have done on those two days, because you're going to be buying some properties and you're going to be getting all the information, you're going to be making all the connections and your life and your bloodline is going to be changed forever. So I need to make sure that you got the most value as well as our sponsors and as well as the marriage between you and our sponsors. I need to make sure that those bonds are solidified and two hours was just not enough. So again, I truly apologize. Okay, now that that's out of the way, December 9th, December 10th, get your tickets ASAP. I'm leaving this discount up for Women in Real Estate Summit because we're making all these changes and I want to make sure that you guys know that I appreciate you. So get a discount, get your discount code for Women in Real Estate Summit at wiresummitdiscount.com. Get your discount, the code, and then after you get the code, you'll be directed to the page where you can use the discount ASAP, okay? All right. All right. Without further ado, I'm not going to keep you guys any longer. My guest is a real estate auntie to me. I respect her so much. And um, she's amazing. She literally has been a landlord for 30 years and she has 0% eviction rate. Zero evictions. I cannot tout that same thing. <laughs> I've had an eviction or two, okay? These people, you know, eviction people people that get eviction, they, evicted, they drive me crazy. So um, you can see I'm learning a lot from my real estate auntie and she will be speaking at the Women in Real Estate Summit. So without further ado, let's hop right into her bio and get into this interview. Kim Avant Bad is a real estate investor, author, and landlord strategist, co-owner of two companies, Bad Properties and Legacy Real Estate Consulting. Kim is passionate about helping small landlords operate their rentals efficiently to increase profits, avoid evictions, and build generational wealth. Along with her husband and business partner, Kim has been self-managing rentals for 39 years with a 0% eviction rate. She has recently made Landlord Docs 30, a digital property management document system available to the investor community, along with landlord coaching and training. After 23 years, Kim recently fired her nine to five. She served as chief strategy officer for a New Jersey state authority, whose focus is financing urban redevelopment projects across the state. Everyone, welcome, Miss Kim. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Hi, Miss Kim. So first of all, before we get in, I got to tell everybody that you are Miss Kim, not Kim. Even though I read off your bio, is Kim. Miss Kim is so classy. You guys are going to see, but we call her Miss Kim, okay? Just make sure you show respect. <laughs> so welcome, Miss Kim. Thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Yes. 
So I'm really grateful. Um, we've known each other for quite some time. I've been a member of BTS and you are a wealth of knowledge. And I can't believe it's my first time sitting down interviewing you. So um, I just read off your bio. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself in your own words? I am so privileged to be here and always uh, excited to be in your just inspiring and beautiful uh, ambiance and, and just energy. So I really, I really appreciate you acknowledging uh, me for the passion that I bring into this space. So uh, as you mentioned, I am, I am multifaceted. I am just a multifaceted, blessed individual. My background and only formal training uh, is as an artist. So I have this creative spirit about me and uh, moved into that space through my career. Uh, talk about my entrepreneurship, though. Uh, I'm a fashion designer. Uh, the first company I started was a, a women's um, fashion uh, line and simultaneously, you know, worked my nine to five and did all the wonderful things that you just mentioned. Uh, but my, my passion right now and for the last two and a half decades has been building wealth through real estate, as you mentioned. So got into uh, acquiring single family rental properties along with my husband uh, with a motherly nudge. I say that uh, from my mother-in-law who was buying real estate into her 70s and spent a solid 10 years of nudging us that you need to buy investment properties. And that's what we finally did and got bit by the bug and started buying and created a why as to why we wanted to do it, which was how are we going to pay for our children's college education? Uh, how were we going to alleviate the, the, the bottomless pit feeling of being laid off from our jobs, not once, twice, but three times? How do we control our own personal economy? And thirdly, as we matured in this space of life, what would happen if social security was not there? How could we create a lifestyle and a, and, and a financial freedom? So that was our why, and that's why we started investing in real estate and really got hooked onto it and uh, created some systems, which I'm proud that, that we were able to bring our skill set from our nine to fives into our business, right? So go from the macro of me working in redevelopment all across the state of New Jersey and bring it into the micro uh, mechanisms and building of bad properties. Uh, you mentioned legacy real estate consulting. I encourage those who will listen to me and others, don't quit your nine to five. Let your nine to five be your silent partner in building your businesses. And we were able to do that. Uh, and I think you remember, Nicole, when I mentioned before I was retiring, before I quit my nine to five or fired it, that I'm going to retire. And I did. It's been three years that I fired my nine to five because it served its purpose in financing our real estate business. And we were done with it. So uh, legacy real estate consulting, as you mentioned, is my passion. I've gone from my career to my calling. I've gone from my career to my calling, pouring out into the community all that I've learned and the systems that we've built along the way. So I'm excited to do that. And uh, here I am. I, I I love I love when you bring that up because it reminds me like I was right there. I had a front row seat. Miss Kim had a, a timer <laughs> counting down the days on her phone. She would come to BTS and be like, Nicole, I'm quitting in 10 months <laughs> or I'm retiring in 10 months. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And I'm like, I know you are <laughs> in my mind. Cause she was so certain of it in my mind. She was already out of there. And then three years ago. Wow. That was September. more than three years ago. No, September was three years ago. But if I can just share another perspective with the audience that I think I've shared with you, uh, that is so divine that I, I just get chills thinking about how I encourage people as I've done is to be obedient to the rhythm of life, right? So the, the backstory is being exposed to and introduced to BTS, I was exposed in, 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 in 2018, uh, coming to WIRE, I think it was the second one, to, um, to hear one of my mentors, uh, Leslie Smallwood Lewis was on the big stage and I came to hear her speak. Um, and unfortunately I had, I had suffered a brain injury like the week before a concussion that I didn't realize how serious it was. Uh, and I came to BTS to that wire, heard her speak, 
you know, participated in all the activities and then had to check out for four months to recover from my brain injury. And I'm, I'm thankful that I came through that. And then I reconnected with BTS, right? And got involved, became a member. And three years later, I'll be at WIRE on the stage. So <laughs> <laughs> I went from <laughs> this being in the audience and watching you and Jabbar and Tracy and all the movers and shakers at that first wire, just, you know, sitting back and observing, seeing Mark and everybody and seeing, wow, this looks like a really hip group and became a member. And here I am three years later being invited to participate in wire. So I'm blessed. What? That is a story. This it was a university city. It was in university city. Right there, yeah, I, I came, I saw, and uh, I've been- That was the second one. That was the second one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that is a story for the ages, especially considering you were nursing an injury like that, like a major injury like that. Got I mean, good. And, and I mean, no no fault to, to the wonderful event that happened, uh, but it was so, <laughs> it was so much, energy and information poured into my brain at wire because you had the dj and everything was popping the next day was the true sign that you need to my injury was serious because it was too much input into my brain and and i had like mild stroke symptoms yeah and that's when i had to take the s off my chest and say you know what i just need to be still and four months later i, I recovered and went back to my nine to five with a three by five white card with the, in red letters, October 9th, 2020 as my retirement date. I kept that to myself. I had my little count countdown calendar and I ticked off the days. So COVID, was, COVID had a silver lining for me because the state shut down in March of 2020. And I only went back in September to clean out my office and had worked remotely from March until September and I was out. Them people ain't know that was the last time they was going to see you back in March. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to move in silence sometimes. We just have to be focused on our mission and be, you know, consistent and, and tenacious and, and, and work the plan and run the play. Wow. Mm. That's an incredible story. I can't wait to cut up these reels. <laughs> Yeah, that's the story. I'm sticking to it. Talk oh, about man. God and, and divine intervention and how if we are paying attention that we can see the hand of God working in our lives. Amen. Amen. That is amazing. Um, amen. Real quick, it's only take a sec, but I promise you, you'll be so valuable. I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors for the Women in Real Estate Summit. 2023 MB Capital Solutions. You guys may have seen on the YouTube channel, I do a lot of content with them. They get our members unsecured business credit to help them get their real estate deals done. So you combine business credit with hard money loans. This is how you can do deals for zero dollars out of pocket. Does your business need to be seasoned, super seasoned and been around for years and years and years? Absolutely not. But they have gotten our members almost $4 million in unsecured business credit. I promise you, I promise you it is well worth the call. So what I need you to do is hit MB Capital up, mbcapitalsolutions.com. Um, I'll post their information down in the description. If you're listening on the podcast, it'll be in the description of the podcast and tell them that Nicole from BTS sent you, you will get a discount on their services. So you need some business credit, you need some credit, you need some ex extra capital, hit MB up and tell Nicole sent you. So Miss Kim, I love your story of how you got started into real estate with your mother-in-law. Um, I thought of a question I never asked you before, but I want you to tell the story and then I'll ask the question um, about your mother-in-law. So my mother-in-law and I, I you know, intentionally drop her name every chance I get, the late Estella Babb. Um, 
my mother-in-law and and so this is this is this is the wider story so my husband and i have been friends for 41 years we've been married for 39 and prior to meeting my husband my family typically owned our family home fine that was my exposure to real estate however it wasn't until i met my husband that not only did they own their family home but his mom owned investment properties like she had a triplex in queen village she had properties in Point Breeze. They lived in, in um, Graduate Hospital. And so it was like, okay, this is different. And so we started dating. And in and, and dating, we used to walk through Rittenhouse Square. We used to go to Center City because they live right the first ring neighborhood for those who are not from Philadelphia. The first ring neighborhood of Center City is called Graduate Hospital. And so that's where he grew up and his mom started buying properties there. Uh, we bought our first primary home, primary home in, in 1985. Uh, up in Logan, you know, a little further away from Center City, and you were young. You guys are young. Twenty four. We were twenty four when we bought our first uh, our first home, and um, but his mom would continuously nag us and say, "You all need to buy investment properties." And Nicole, we were partying. The ha the party was at our house every weekend. We were digging a deep hole of debt. Uh, we were just having a good time as a young couple building a family and we really didn't have the disposable income. Or I should say, we chose not to use our disposable <laughs> income for investments. We were too busy partying. But it took mom bad 10 years of nagging us and calling us. Uh, whereas one time she called and said, listen, I came across two properties. I want to buy one and you all need to buy the other one. Again, broken record. Mom, we don't have no money. And she said it cost $14,000. Unbeknownst to my husband, she said, listen, and let me just say, Mom Bab was a college educated factory seller. She had a college education, but back then she couldn't get a job other than in a factory sewing, as my mother did, as my aunt did. They were all factory sewers. But Mom Bab, she she worked in a factory, but she she was she was an investor, she was a saver. And unbeknownst to us, she had saved fourteen thousand dollars for my husband, for his inheritance, unbeknownst to him, and said, I will give it to you now to buy this house with the understanding that when I die, you will not get an inheritance. My husband looked at me, I looked at him, I'm like, okay. We went to settlement with her the same day and brought this home uh, that we still own in Graduate Hospital for $14,000. On the same day? Well, she we went to settlement. She brought, it was two houses side by side. And we went to the same settlement table. She did her deal, we did our deal. Oh, okay, okay. And, yeah, and, and the deals were done. So that's how we got into investing. We inherited a tenant with that that was paying like $200 a month. We let him stay there. Um, but prior to that, we had been managing her rental properties. Mom Bab was into cutting deals, right? So she had a contractor that was going to foul on this triplex in Queen Village. So she made a deal with my husband. Listen, if you finish the project, you can keep the rent. You know where date night was. <laughs> date night was him figuring out the plumbing, the electric, the carpentry. He finished that property and we got the rents. And so that was our first foray into property managing, uh, figuring it out, just, you know, winging it, learning, educating ourselves. And that was our, our entree into property management, managing my mother-in-law's properties. And then we, we purchased ours, as I just mentioned. And then, you know, the story just goes on and on from there. Yeah. Did she have other kids? Did she do this with other kids or she just saw something in you guys? None of her other kids responded to her nagging, except for us. Now, her other children who, her uh, just one other child that does have properties, she she actually gave her daughter a property. She Back then, like, you could buy a property in Philly for a dollar. Or my mother-in-law, her friends were passing away. People knew that Miss Bad, Miss Estelle, brought properties. And they would come to her, you know, Miss Johnson, kids, they don't want that house. They could really lose it. She said how much they want. Bam, bam, bam. She buy it, right? <laughs> and, and she would buy a couple properties and she gave a few to, to her daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And we even did a deal back and forth where she owned the property. We bought it from her. She brought it back from us. 
and then we bought it back from her. It was mine was a real <laughs> deal. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I like that type of monopoly. Yes, Ma was willing and dealing, but she exposed us to this phenomenal, you know, world of real estate investing that we are so grateful for. And at times, um, you know, as we move about, my husband and I, and when we're in a space of, of gratitude, we will say to each other, Ma would be really proud of what we did with the seed that she planted. So question, do you know how old my bab was when she first started, when she bought her first property? No, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I, the, the reason I ask that is because, you know, a lot of times um, people think it's too late. Well, I do know that she was still buying properties into her seventies. she was 70. Yeah. Yes. I don't know when she started, but I do know she was still buying properties in into her 70s. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, when, when she passed away, uh, you know, she talk about, uh, you know, wealth is built quietly. Like you would, she, she was so unassuming that she had so much wealth in real estate mm. and accounts everywhere, like little accounts everywhere. And we got to see it because my husband was her executor. So we really got to see, you know, what, what she had built. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question. If there is anything or I don't know, whatever you can think of in terms of how to leave a legacy that you would take from her outside of, you know, egging your kids on to do it, what would, what would it, what would it be? What would you take from her in terms of how you're leaving your legacy to your boys? Well, really live by example, live by example. Uh, because not necessarily our sons are directly involved in real estate. They've been exposed to it. Not directly are our grandchildren involved in it. They've been exposed to it. Um, so what I would encourage and, and, and hope is that be an example, right? Because we never know who's listening and who's watching. And here's a story for you. We have three sons, as I mentioned earlier. We have 10 grandchildren. We have three sons. 10 girl, grandchildren, nine of them are girls. We have one grandson, right? And uh, our soon to be 17 year old granddaughter is very vivacious. She already wants to be a prosecutor. She wants to be an attorney. She's very clear. And I think it was two summers ago, we were on a family outing at a trip supporting her sister. We were in line waiting to get into this theater. I go back to speak to the cluster that are behind us and she's in the group and uh, you know, small chats going on. And she, she said, Nana, did I tell you that when I go to college, I'm going to buy a property off campus and I'm going to rent rooms and I'm going to be the on-site property manager? I think I hugged her like seven times. I said, somebody is listening. Like, we don't know who's watching and who's listening. Here, my granddaughter has picked up on it. She's embrace the concept. She understands the benefit, the monetary benefit, the wealth growing benefit of what Nana and Pop Pop are doing. So sometimes it skips a generation. Um, and well, that's and why the, the scripture says a good man leaves wealth to his children's children, knowing that you want to, I, I think she did a Bible study on one time. We have, we put so much focus on our immediate kids because we put too much focus on nurture over nature like you can do everything show them you don't know who that person is you don't know who that baby is yes you can expose them to everything do everything you can to try to make them this perfect person but they come here pre-programmed yeah <laughs> and so if you're thinking about your children's children all you can do is just plant the seeds that's it you can't control anything no and plant many seeds I was just um, looking at a poster that I have in my studio that talks about leaving a spiritual legacy, right? Because it's not just wealth, it's, it's the, uh, the legacy of gratitude, the legacy of, of spirituality, the uh, legacy of, of, of prayer, the legacy of generosity. There's so many other types of legacy other than wealth, right? That, that we can leave by living as an example. Very, very, very true.
Very true. Amen. So, Miss Kim, why don't you tell us a little bit about your 0% eviction rate? You've been in this game for 39 years. Mm -hmm. I've been in it for six, seven, something like that. I'm so far from 0% eviction rate. <laughs> I mean, these jokers. <laughs> and I'll be trying to actually, I just put your book. Dang, why? I've been, I had your book on, I cleaned off my desk today. I had your book on my desk for months. And then I was like, I kept coming in my office and it was just a mess. And I put it in where on the other side of the house where my bookshelf mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I try to follow the Miss Kim formula for 0% eviction rate. And um, I don't know. I think they just think I'm a joke. <laughs> they see the dimples and they think I'm a joke. I don't know what it is. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I think definitely we we did, you and I did um, a mastermind on the landlord MSRP formula, which mm -hmm. is mindset, skill set, resources, and what's your plan, right? The landlord MSRP formula. Um, so to answer your question and curiosity about how we arrived at a 0% eviction rate, number one, it was not intentional. It wasn't like we set out 39 years ago managing mom Babs property saying, you know, we're going to be these phenomenal uh, property managers and we're never going to evict anybody. I, I believe it was as a result of us creating systems of screening uh, applicants for our rental properties. Uh, in addition to, again, as I encourage individuals to not discount that nine to five, because building skill sets, that's where you build skill sets, right? Based on different types of jobs that you have, different types of managers that you have, different types of leadership skills that you create. And I believe that I've always been in corporate on the administrative side, and I've brought those skills into our business. I retired as chief strategy officer of the New Jersey Redevelopment Authority. It, it denotes how my mind works. I'm very compartmentalized. I'm creating a form for everything, an intake form, a process form. Um, and so I brought those skills into our business and created documents and checklists and forms and boxes and agreements. Um, and in addition, I think in retrospect that we have had um, a good sense of reading people, you know, um, having a good gut feeling about people, being able to judge people. Uh, and there's no shame in saying this is a no judgment zone. No, in our rental properties, if you want the key to our asset, I'm going to judge you. And I'm going to be clear that I'm judging you based on the gathering of the documentation, the interviews that I have with you, the opening questions that I'm asking you, uh, your employment, I'm following the money and everything. So it's been a combination of having a clear eight step screening process that we've created over the years. In addition to just having a good intuition about people, being able to read people, being able to measure people up. Uh, and we have discarded, we have denied uh, only a few applicants by using this process because their standards didn't meet our standards. And uh, if you've heard me speak before, I've done workshops where I have correlated our screening process with dating, right? When I'm checking you, when, when you come to us and say you want to rent, rent one of our properties, it's like going on a blind date, right? You want to have a relationship with this person, but you don't really know them. So you need to check them out. And then you move you know, down the road a little bit because you think you have chemistry and you, you've got to ask hard questions. You say, okay, I think this relationship might work. Uh, you draw up the, the lease, which is the prenup, right? The pre and prenups, like you agree on certain things, I agree on the other things. And we go into this relationship whereby, again, you're asking us for the keys to our asset. Think about that. Like you have scraped, borrowed, not stole, but just did whatever you needed to do to get your first rental property, which is your asset. And a stranger wants you to give them the keys. That's a major ask. So for us, we have a very high bar that you have to meet in order for us to give you the keys to our to our asset. Think about the legacy of Mom Bab, that $14,000 gift that she gave us that is now almost worth $400,000. You want me to just give you the keys to that and do whatever you want? 
ain't going to happen. You need, to, you need to sign a prenup. We'll sign the prenup, and then I'll give you the keys, which is like putting the ring on the finger. We married now. It's like a marriage. That lease is a legal contract that holds both of you accountable. Um, and then what we do not ever want to experience, we don't know what the future holds, but an eviction is like a divorce. And if anybody has ever been in any kind of relationship, a divorce is emotional, it's costly, it's ugly, and it's something that you really want to avoid. So, you know, having those thoughts in mind when we are, uh, um, you know, considering someone to be a tenant, those are the criteria that they have to meet. And we make it very clear. So I have like tapped out at five feet even, right? I'm not going to mention my weight, but let me say, I'm very clear in my tone and my tenor when I am onboarding the tenant about what our expectations what our expectations are. And I think it comes over very clear. I'm a communicator, so I'm making things very clear. You know what I expect. You know what I'm gonna, what my company is going to deliver to you, which is a quality home. So let's not play games. And don't play with my, don't play with my money. Don't play with my money. <laughs> Cause this five foot high, person will turn into like a 10 foot jolly green giant and haunt you for the rest of your life if you mess up <laughs> our girl for city victory don't mess with my money because i'm going to we are responsive we are respectful of our tenants like we were just in mexico and had a maintenance call come through it was handled in 24 hours and our tenant who we also call our on-site property manager because they're the first line of defense of anything that's going on with their property. So we want to have a solid relationship with them because these are our assets. If there's a leak coming up or down, anything happening, I want you to communicate and we'll be right on it because we want those assets to continue to perform for us. Right. So that's how we approach it. And it's worked well for us. Have we had a couple of um, individuals who, you know, might want to, uh, you know, buck our system or push back a little bit? Yeah, we've only had a few, but we've set them straight. And, you know, it's been a mutually beneficial relationship and uh, we've moved on. So, <laughs> so question, what types of, when you do, okay, so uh, most of the stuff is outlined in your book. We'll post the link to your book down below in the description. But um, in terms of the more technical things, you know, your checklist and all that stuff your book and your, your document bundle. Mm -hmm. What about when you're doing the interview? What are some of the questions that are not normal questions, not standard questions that you ask to find out a little bit more about who they are? Give us some examples of, of those questions. Sure. And so pre COVID, um, we, well, I guess for probably like the last six years, we've had a showing agent. So we no longer show our units. We have a showing agent. They list it, they market, you know, they show the properties, they give us a short list of viable candidates. Um, so there that is, right? But previously, previous to COVID, I would meet with those final applicants um, to go over the application, let them know what the next steps are. And then in that environment, you can ask opening questions. You can get a feel for the person's body language, you know, their tone, their tenor, um, how they're responding to you. Now, within COVID, we actually, uh, leased up and rented like three units during COVID. So we had to go to technology, just like you and I are doing. I did Zoom meetings with them, okay? And in the checklist bundle, there's a list of questions. Like I'm asking you opening questions and guess what I'm doing? I'm closing my mouth and I'm listening because people will share with you things about them that you need to know. And, and that's the point, like we have to be good listeners in this type of exchange. Like, for example, are you familiar with the neighborhood? Uh, well, I actually live like two blocks away. You know, my girlfriend lives right around the corner. So we're, you know, really excited about me living close to her. I go, my kids go to school here. That's why I want to stay in that zip code. So, you know, they'll respond to opening questions. Are you from the city? Some people are moving from outside of the city. Uh, yeah, I'm moving in town for a job uh, or I'm a student at Penn. You know, my parents, they did da, 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 da. So they'll tell you if you ask an opening question and be quiet. So I use Zoom 
for that purpose. Additionally, uh, historically, if it's geographically um, uh, possible, as a final um, determination, we'll do a site visit where they currently live. What did we do during Zoom, during COVID? We uh, required that they take um, a picture of four different areas where they currently live, four, four, four different rooms, you know, in, in their current abode. I want to see how you're living. I want to see how you're living. Because how you're living there is how you're going to live in our asset. And we have actually denied an applicant based on a site visit. Because if I'm if I'm dropping 40, 50 grand into a total gut rehab, it's been as that's been years ago, because it's much more expensive now. But if I'm dropping <laughs> I was about that, to be like, where you gonna... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but if I'm doing a whole gut rehab and I walk through your space and you've got standards of cleanliness that doesn't meet our standards, I can't. I can't knowingly expect you to change in our asset. And I have no problem saying no. And not necessarily saying, well, you know, I'm denying you because you had two inches of grease on the backsplash of that stove. But I don't, I'm not going to say that. It's just denied. And, and, and our eight steps of screening a rental applicant is very routine, is very standard. So we just, analyzed all of the data and made a determination. So I want to come back to something that you, you talked about. <laughs> it's more of a statement. You, you compared pre screening a tenant to the dating process. Mm -hmm. so you say, you know, you meet the person and you want to get to know who they are and then you're doing a deeper dive. You know, most people don't date that way. <laughs> they don't be really do, so you might need to start teaching people how to date. <laughs> <laughs> and and we and we we agreed at the at the onset of this conversation that I come from a totally different generation. Yes. So I'm bringing that culture with me into our business. So whether or not you date like that or not, if you want my goodies, then you got to follow my script. <laughs> Most people don't date like that. Okay. No, I, I do. I, I learned some hard lessons. I, I got a whole thing now where my, my, my girlfriends laugh because like you are being interviewed and they, they're laughing at me because they think I'm denying quality. Mm -hmm. They they're think they're quality. I'm like, no, I've interviewed this person and I've mm -hmm. concluded my interview and I, I, I'm not, not saying they're a bad person, mm -hmm. but that's not a party I want to attend. <laughs> I'm, and you know, most of the time, these men, they don't even know they're being interviewed because, and this is my point that I'm, I'm making, because mm -hmm. these days, it's not an interview process happening. And this to bring it all back to real estate, mm -hmm. in my early evictions or early problem tenants, I didn't do that. I mm -hmm. didn't do the interview process. It looked like, you know, you you check off a couple of boxes. Oh, okay, your your credit is this. You don't have nothing crazy on your credit. You got the income. Here's your pay stubs. I'll talk to them on FaceTime. That I will always do. But at the end of the day, like, you don't know. Like, I'm, I don't have luxury units. So you don't know how far down you got to drop your standards. So it's like, oh, this person can talk. <laughs> you know, they seem like they can hold the job. And when I look back on all the tenants who gave me problems, when mm -hmm. I did FaceTime them, I was scratching my head. Like, so you had a gut feeling that you ignored. Yeah, but you just, I had a gut feeling, but at the same time, right. And maybe you could talk to this for some of my properties. They are in C and D class neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I can't expect someone who's willing to live in some of the C and D class neighborhoods that I don't expect them to be like my, like one of my best friends. So it's like, I'm not going to penalize you because you don't have perfect English. No. Or I'm not going to penalize you because you, your, your, your life circumstance is something maybe that I wouldn't, you know, may not have happened to me. So okay. it's like, you think to yourself like, okay, this person seems reasonable. 
you know, they got they they got some things going on, mm-hmm. but you know what? They're they're looking to rent a place. I want to help them. And then <laughs> I just didn't do a good enough interview. And I, I guess I should say it's not even that I had red flags. I just didn't do a good enough interview to even mm-hmm. really sort through the flags. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just it. looked at the whole picture and was like, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and so I, I, many times I talk about, you know, separating the emotion from the deal. Right. And, um, and, uh, you know, assessing a quality tenant based on the data and not on emotion. Okay. And most of our units are in, um, the B class. Right. But we do have, we do have a unit or two in the C class. Right. Um, so we have had that variety of tenants. And what I'll say is it's not a, for, for us, for our company, it's not, you know, the question of A, B, C, D, or E. We're looking for someone with integrity, someone with honesty, someone with a consistent, um, uh, you know, income stream and someone who is responsive and willing to communicate. I think those softer requirements will get us through the tough times because if someone is not responsive and there's an issue, they're not going to return your call. They're not going to return your text when they get into a jam. What we found during COVID uh, was that because of the type of tenants that we have selected with all of those qualities, um, everybody knew what COVID represented. And what I did for our company is I called each and every one of our tenants, even if it was like a house with three roommates, I called each and every one of our tenants and said, how you doing? I, I asked that open end question again and I shut up because everybody knew what COVID represented. And because we had created the relationship, the open line of communication, the respect for each other, they said, you know what? We're fine. I'm glad you called. Or you know, one of our roommates got laid off, but we think we'll be fine. You know what I'm saying? And so our response was going to be in those situations because of how, you know, our portfolio looks, which I will say that investors were really tested during COVID, whether or not they were over leveraged or not. It created a whole different stress level. So it's, we're not, it's not, it wasn't during COVID, it's now. Yes. But even during COVID, when you had people yeah, not able it wasn't to pay for different reasons, so there's a different stress level when you're not over leveraged. I'll just put it there. So, so we knew depending on the response on the other end of the phone with a tenant who had been committed, uh, communicative, respectful, taking care of our asset for the last three, four, five, we have a tenant that's about to sign her 15th year lease. Do you think that during COVID, if she would have got laid off that we would have said, you know what, like uh, you can't skip a beat or you out. Heck no. We were ready to say, we got you. Right. But again, and that's in the lower class um, uh, uh, asset. Integrity, honesty, responsiveness, communicative. And then you got to have the revenue stream to pay the rent. But I think those other qualities, you know, stand stronger uh, and make more of a difference in the relationship building with your tenants. So that's what we're looking for. And so in that eight steps of, of screening a rental applicant, you know, correlating with those soft uh, qualities that I just mentioned, I'm comparing your application to what you say to me on the Zoom. I'm comparing what you put on your application to what your manager says to me on the phone when I call to confirm your employment. I'm comparing what you put on your application to what your landlord, and not only the current landlord, if I, I've gone three landlords back in screening rental applicants. I'm comparing what they're saying about you. So integrity, honesty, you know, morals, uh, because I find that those type of individuals don't punch holes in your walls. They don't, you know, allow their kids to just, you know, use your walls as a coloring book and, and just destroy your property. Like I see, unfortunately, sometime on these lives when, you know, um, investors are, are walking through a property that a tenant has just moved out. I'm saying that's just disrespectful to leave a property like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, there was something else you said too that I've realized that I 
didn't do and I need to do this. You, when you had a leasing agent, you had them give you a short list. I basically let my leasing agent choose. Like I would interview them and then say, no, like a couple of times, like I would let them give me one versus just saying, hey, give me four or five different people. And so, yeah, I never thought about that. And you've said that a bunch of times and I never thought about that. And so when when I talk about, you know, coaching um, my clients around um, how to manage their real estate directly or how to manage their property managers. Right. And that could be a showing agent or a full blown property manager. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say that we are. What am I trying to say? Like um, control freaks. Right. But we are so committed to. Um, having a 0% eviction rate and not having, you know, awful relationships with individuals that we will not release that final piece of the process of, of choosing that, 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 that tenant. We're not allowing to give that up to a property manager or a showing agent who gets their commission and they're gone. They're and gone. we're left with, we're left holding the bag of who this individual or individuals are. We're, we're not willing to, to release that control. So, and even to the point where um, our showing agents, they use our applications, right? I want you to use my application, not the standard Pennsylvania realtor application. That doesn't work for how we screen that applicant and all the boxes that we need to check. Uh, so again, I believe you have to manage your, your, your person on the bench that's showing that property, that's, that's you know, selecting those, those applicants for you and decide how you want to play in that equation. But we've never given up the final, the final determination. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, in, 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 you know, considering different individuals to do as the work of showing agents, um, we were considering someone new at one particular time and they started asking like very pointed questions. Well, how are you going to collect the rent? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? I'm like, hold up, wait a minute. I'm hiring you to do A. You let me worry about B, C, and D. They were realtors, but also property managers. So they were crossing the line into my space and I didn't invite them there. I'm giving you the task of the front end. You hand me the baton and I'll finish it off and my company will continue to manage the property. That's not what I'm hiring you for, but you know, you have to manage people. Would you ever consider hiring a property manager? Yes. I mean, at some point, listen, because <laughs> the, but the portfolio we have to get is going to grow. Say again? The portfolio going to grow. I said yes, um, based on where we are in our season of life. We might want to live abroad somewhere, right? I don't, you know, I, so it, it, it may be a team of individuals. It may be a property manager that really, you know, would have to meet a certain standard, but I'm not, I'm not excluding that from the realm of possibility for right now. No, but in the future, who knows? Cause we travel in the world. It might be some place we land is like, I really like this place. You know, I don't want to be anchored because our assets are here. You know, I'm all about that. It's got to be, <laughs> if it ain't a property manager involved, <laughs> And, and get partially, it, partially and get because, in where you fit in, like get in what, what, wherever, whatever works for you. Right. And I, it, I didn't do a property manager before I had JD, partially because I have a small child that requires so much of, uh, I just, I, that's just the way I parent. I, I'm mm -hmm. very active. Mm -hmm. And so um, because I have him, I feel like that's, that's something that I have to do is, is have a property manager. Um, and, before I and, didn't, I used to do and, everything. I don't believe one size fits everybody. I also believe that we should recognize what season we are, not only in our business of building a portfolio, because I talk about, you know, the seed, um, you know, the watering and then the harvest, right? In reference to building your portfolio, but also parallel to that, where you are in your life. Are you a new mother? Are you single? You know, are you just married? Are you um, really, you know, excelling in your career? Uh, are you where we are in the stage of life where 
we both fight our nine to fives. They, they've served their purpose. My husband just retired in March. I retired three years ago and we're at a different season in our life. So recognize what season you are in your personal life, as well as your real estate journey. Amen. Cause it's not a quick thing. It's not based on my experience. I don't know how deep your pockets are, but you know, life and, and developing the portfolio is not linear. And neither is life. So I think you have to recognize that and also recognize that it's going to take some time, hopefully not 39 years to get like to where we are. But my journey is not your journey. Your journey is not anybody else's journey. So that whole comparing uh, to what we see on social media and what we hear in these networking groups, everybody's journey is going to be different. True that. And everybody's portfolio is different. <laughs> True that. Yes. Well, Ms. Kim, this has been a pleasure as always. I'm going to finish up with one question. I kind of prepped you for it. Um, I have not given everyone their assignments that are all the speakers for women in real estate summit have not given their assignments yet. But if there is anything in the world that you could talk about at wire on November 11th, 2023 in Philly, what would it be? It, 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 it's a broad response to that, but what I would encourage listeners to consider in this real estate journey is to not only chase the money, but chase the experience. Not to just chase the money, but chase the experience. And also, you know, think in a more global way of designing your life versus letting your life design you. So take a step back, take a broader perspective and kind of hinging on what I just mentioned about what season you're in, but not just let life happen to you, right? And use real estate to, to, to run your plays, to design your life rather than having life happen to you. Like, you know, just getting stuck in the culture of the work environment, you know, think outside of that realm and see how you can design your life and not just chase the money, but chase the experience. Hmm. I like that. Chase the experience. That's something that I'm learning right now. Chasing the experience. And enjoying the experience and valuing the experience. I be wanting the money so bad. <laughs> well, you know, we need money. We all need money, Nicole. We do. I just like, I just enjoy. It's, it's funny. I was looking at, um, I was looking at a book on my bookshelf. I don't know if you know, but I collect books. I read, I read them. I re read probably, I don't know, 80% of the books. I have this huge bookshelf library thing and I just mm -hmm. I also like to collect them I like to have the physical books mm -hmm. so I, I came across this book today that I didn't even realize I had the name of the book is called winning I don't remember it's by somebody such and such somebody big whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was a gift to me because it doesn't look like anything that I would have bought and so I just walked away thinking like wow winning is so important to people it's not that important to me and I was like, well, what's important to me? I truly enjoy making money. I don't love it because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But I enjoy making money. And I don't know if you would equate that to winning. I don't need to like feel like I'm in a competition over somebody. That has never been important to me. I just enjoy making money. I like to do something. I like to plant a seed. Work the soil, mm -hmm. harvest and reap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. I like that cycle. When it doesn't go that way, when I'm planting, 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 <laughs> that makes me just miserable. But um, I just enjoy. I enjoy making money, and so I, the more of the story is, I, I do need to be more looking. I'm learning how to just look forward to the journey and just enjoy the journey and, and 
and have that as my goal. Because right now where I am, as I think about my future and I think about the future of my business, I feel Mm -hmm. like I can do whatever I want to do. And it makes it very difficult to make a choice on where, what road you want to go, because it's like, you can do whatever you want to do. And because I can do whatever I want to do, the next thing that I have to choose is which journey do I want? Hmm. You've got I, options. You've got options, though. We all have options, for real, for real. Yeah, but some have more, you know, fruitful. Um, people have different options. And and I think, and I've taught that to my sons. Like, in life, like, you want to maximize your choices and maximize your options. Because those with limited options, you know, have a limited type of existence. So it sounds like you... you you know, embrace the the concept of of building and maximizing your options. Uh, that's a good thing. It is, but I just I I, I decided today that um because I, I I've been I finished my last rehab in June, and I I think I've talked about this on social media. I'm taking a beat right now, just trying to figure Ooh. out. But I feel the pressure of my purpose. Like Nicole, you need to get in the project. Like you gotta do something. You got you can't just be sitting here. You gotta do something. You know, we gotta be growing this thing. And with that being said, I, I decided that I'm gonna focus on wire for this last at this point, we're like three weeks out. I'm gonna mm-hmm. focus on wire and then after that, then I'm gonna get busy on okay. making a decision on what I wanna do next. I, I think I've narrowed it down, but we'll see. Time we shall see. Yes. Time so, Miss Kim, thank you so much for that. I really, really, really appreciate you. Um, you are a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure that this information, this is real estate, 400 level real estate. This is advanced real estate. You know, this, this is not how you get your first property. Is what you're going to do when you got it. And so <laughs> how to be a good steward over your resources, right? And so um, I thank you, Miss Kim. Thank you so much. Where can people learn more about you and more and grab your bundles and your book and all that good stuff? Yeah, definitely at uh, www.lldocs30.com. That's www.lldocs30.com. That's my website. You can check me out and, uh, you know, take a peek at all of our products. And I'm also media go ahead oh i was gonna say on instagram which your yes on instagram at lldocs30 as well lldocs30 and the story behind that that um that handle is that when, when i first launched this company uh ll docs is the name of our um property management bundle landlord docs 30 and initially i just was saying oh we've got 30 years of you know zero eviction 30 years so that's where the 30 came from however i was in a um a, a coaching program and my, my 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 coach insisted no i don't want you to just say 30 plus years because i was saying 30 plus years count the number of years that you've had a zero percent eviction rate and it came to 39 so but you know i kept the handle as it is ll docs 30 but that's that's the story behind where that came from and uh the push to to really represent how many daggone years have you had a zero percent eviction rate is 39. 39. Older than most of (laughs) y'all. I love that, Miss Kim. Thank you so much. You are such an inspiration. I appreciate you. And um, I will see you soon. I will definitely see you on November 11th at Wire Summit on that stage doing your thing. And um, congratulations. I'm excited for this this journey for you and this, this testimony. It's such a beautiful story. I appreciate you and I appreciate the opportunity and I will be uh, especially filled based on the opening uh, of this interview and the story of the full circle of probably four years of me coming as an attendee and now being on stage. Thank Thank you, you. Ms. Kim. Thank you.